You wanna make him the Lord, master, and ruler of your life. Based on your confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Raised to walk a new life. I want you to thank all these young people on the worship team. They did such a good job today. And uh, that little video, uh, they're having D groups. That's a discipleship group. That's what that stands for. And uh, we have life groups for adults in the church, but discipleship groups are for teenagers. And so it's all geared uh, towards them. And inside your bulletin, there's a way, an announcement there for you to sign your children up for that. And if I were you living in this world today, I would do anything in my power uh, to make sure my children have a spiritual foundation in their life. Otherwise, I don't think they're gonna make it uh, without that. So make sure if you have a child uh, in those teenage years, you sign them up for those D groups starting next week. I wanna show you a little chart, okay? This is a attendance chart from last weekend here on this campus. We have four campuses, one up in Aqua Dulce. We have one out in Simi Valley. They had a record crowd last week out there. They had over 1,300 people out of the Simi Valley campus last week. And uh, then we have a campus down in Woodland Hills, uh, down there on DeSoto by uh, Kaiser Hospital. But this is this campus, Porter Ranch. We have a Saturday night service and you've got to look there. We have close to 2,100 people here every Saturday night. Then at 9 o'clock, uh, we just had a service, just got finished with it. We had close to 2,200 people. And then we have a service here on Thursday night. And we had a record crowd there of over 800 people. Now, all these campuses and all these services, it's the same sermon. I write this sermon. And uh, whoever's preaching out in Simi Valley, they're preaching the same sermon. It has their own little twist to it, but same sermon. Thursday night, if you come Thursday night, it's the same sermon. So if you ever can't get here on a Sunday morning, come to one of those other campuses or other services. However, this building only seats about 3,500 people. And last weekend, we had close to 4,000 people at 11 o'clock. But... We literally had to shut the doors and tell people they had to go somewhere else because there were, there were no empty chairs here. And so we do this every once in a while. I get up here and I beg. It's okay to beg. Uh, I, I beg and ask for those of you that don't mind and are able to, to switch over to either Saturday night uh, at 6 o'clock or to come early at 9 o'clock or to change and start coming on Thursday nights. And the reason we do that is because most visitors who show up for church tend to show up at the 11 o'clock hour, and we just don't have enough space. And so we ask from time to time, so we just want you to look at this. We need almost 2,000 people, that's a lot of people, to move to one of those other uh, service times. So if you don't mind doing that, uh, you can help us out. If you don't wanna change, then don't change, don't change, just keep coming and we'll figure something out. But uh, I think a lot of this is the result of all the people we're inviting to church uh, this year and those cards that you're handing out. So we wanna, we wanna thank the Lord uh, for that. Today, we're in the middle of a five-week series, five weeks long, and we're in the, in the middle week of a five-week series called Read the Signs. Everybody say, Read the Signs. And we're trying to read the signs that confirm for us that we're living in the last days. We're reading the signs of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Last two weekends, we've been in the, in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 24. Today, I want you to take your Bibles and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We want to move from the book of Matthew over to 2 Timothy Matthew 24, the last two weeks, we've looked at Jesus' words concerning the end times. We're going to move from that and go over to 2 Timothy. We're going to read about the Apostle Paul. We want to read what he has to say about the end times. Now, the last two weeks over in Matthew's gospel, we've talked about world events because that it, it kind of talks about world events all aligning themselves, and when you see these world events aligning themselves, you know that those are the birth pains 
that, are, uh, uh, that reveal to us that Jesus' return is right around the corner. I read all kinds of articles this week. I read one on North Korea testing new cruise missiles, flaunting their nuclear capability. We read details on the Israel-Hamas war, live updates. I read one article called Why Iran Doesn't Want United States Forces Out of Iraq. I also saw today uh, that our soldiers have been, uh, they've been receiving these incoming missiles and there were three, two or three United States military personnel that were killed uh, yesterday uh, in, these, in these strikes. I saw this article, I wanted to show you a picture of it. It's an AP article and it has what's called a doomsday clock where they have this group that look at existential threats of nuclear war, climate disasters, and AI, and in their analogy of how close the world is to wiping humanity off the face of the earth, according to their clock, it's called the doomsday clock, now this isn't very positive, but this is according to them, that we are 90 seconds away from midnight, according to that clock. Now we don't know if that's true or not, but as we move from Matthew 24 to this text in 2 Timothy 3, instead of looking at the world events and how they align, 2 Timothy 3 talks more about the heart of man and the behavior that you see within the heart of people. Some signs that we see are on a national level and some signs are on an individual level of lawlessness and immorality. And all this goes hand in hand because God's judgment upon a nation is often due to the overall collective behavior of the individuals within that particular nation. And so today we have three different levels of conversation here today. The first, we won't take much time on, I want you to write this down, is what is the definition of the last days? The Bible talks about last days. Well, what is that? What, what is that uh, timeline? And so we wanna talk about the timeline for just a few moments. We did talk about this the last couple of weeks, but we have several hundred people here that were not here the last two weeks, and so we wanna kinda catch them up to speed. 2 Timothy 3, verse one, the very first verse says, mark this. Whenever you see mark this, it means take a note, underline it, put an asterisk, exclamation mark, pay attention to this. He says, mark this, that there will be terrible times in the what? In the last days. Now, what is the last days? Well, it has several meanings. The primary uh, meaning is it refers to the time period right before the Lord returns. That's what it means, all right? That's pretty simple to understand. There's also another uh, example or illustration that he's referring to is that the last days is the time period between the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus, which we're waiting on. 2,000 years ago, Jesus was here. He died, he was buried, he resurrected, and then he ascended. And right before he ascended, he said, hey, I'm gonna leave, but he said two things, I will be back. But he also said, don't worry about me leaving because I'm going to send a comforter. I'm gonna send someone in my place. And he was referring to that when he leaves that he's going to send the Holy Spirit. So in Acts chapter one, in Acts chapter one, was where Jesus ascended. In Acts chapter two, this is 2,000 years ago, is when the Holy Spirit fell. And that's why Peter refers to this in Acts two. He says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. So you have the first coming of Jesus, and then he ascends, and he sends the Holy Spirit, that's when the time period of the last days begin. And here we are 2,000 years later, we're still waiting for Jesus Christ to return. So that's the period of the last days. But there's another nuance in this text. He's alluding to the fact that if you wanna know the true sign, if, you're, if you really wanna know when you're living in the last days, you better write this down. Here's the clue. 
There will be terrible times in the last days. I want you to write that down in, under that first area uh, of your notes, the timeline and these times that he calls the terrible times. Now, it's the idea that when morally, morally speaking, things go from bad to worse, and things have always been bad, but when you see things going from bad to really bad, things are accelerating as far as how wicked things are, you'll know that it's getting close. There's this old joke about the fella who was told, you know what, you need to cheer up. And things, will get, things could be worse. And so he cheers up, and sure enough, things get worse. That's in a nutshell what he's saying here. Paul is writing from a prison cell in Rome. He's in a bad situation. And he's writing this letter to his young protege, a man by the name of Timothy. And he's telling Timothy, Timothy, I know I'm in prison, things look bad, but Timothy, you need to know that things are gonna get worse before they get better. And don't lose your faith, prepare yourself. The, everything that you see happening when they go from bad to worse, these terrible times, you just need to know that these are all signs that Jesus Christ is about to return. Now, there's an interesting note here that if you've got your thinking caps on, I just want to share you with you. The word terrible, this word, everybody say terrible, that word is only found two times in the entire New Testament. It's found once here, talking about how things are going to be terrible before Jesus Christ returns. But the, other, only, other, the only other time you find this word is in Matthew chapter 8, verse 28, when Jesus is talking about two violent men who were demon-possessed in the region of Gadara, and these two wild, violent, uncontrollable men lived in a cemetery, and anybody who walked past that cemetery, these two demon-possessed, violent men would, 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 would beat you up. That's how violent and terrible they were. And what Paul is saying when he uses this same word in, in, in light of the second coming, he's saying that when you see the world spiraling out of control and it seems like madmen are ruling the day and things are violent and things are dangerous and things seem frightening and man have, men have cast off all moral constraint and society appears to be uh, you know, like falling apart at the seams. When you see that happening, you need to wake up because all of this are their signs that the end is near. And I don't know if you look around and what you see going on in our culture today. I, I, like I shake my head like every day when I when I hear stuff like like Lord, you've got to just about be coming because you can't put up with this much longer. Can someone say Amen? So the period of the last days, number two, let's move into the second section of our discussion, where in the next three to four verses, Paul, very in, in, in great detail, he describes for us the worsening condition of depravity of mankind. As we read these descriptions, you would be a fool to read what you're about to read and not put two and two together and realize that we're living in these terrible days that he's talking about. In these next few verses, he gives us 20. Everybody say 20. He gives us 20 different characteristics of corruption. He gives us 20 elements of evil, 20 signals of shamelessness, 20 indications of immorality, 20 details of depravity, 20 windows of wickedness, 20 samples of sins that when you see these things happening, they all point to the return of Jesus Christ. And as you read through this list of 20 things, now when you read, we're gonna read through them. When you read them, if, if, if there's only two or three that you see happening out of the 20, you might think, well, he's not, it's not that, it's not getting that close. But when you read all 20 and you see all 20 happening now, 
you better realize that these are indicators that Jesus Christ is about ready to return and you best wake up. He writes of two things, write this down. He writes of the worsening wickedness, but he also catalogs the carnality of the culture. Just step by step by step, he lists all these things. So we're gonna look at all 20, is that okay? We're gonna touch, everybody say touch. We're not gonna go in detail, we're just gonna touch on these things. But this is important before we get to the third area of our discussion today. Number one, he says, the first sign is that people will be lovers of themselves. Do you see that happening in our culture today? Have you ever been on Instagram? <laughs> TikTok? All these selfies and just the culture that believes that their opinion is the only opinion that matters and you only see the world as what's in it for you and your favorite words are I, 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 me, 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 mine, 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 mine. And your only purpose is to please yourself. And that's, that's it's become a self-obsession of self. Number two on the list, when you see this happening, you'll know it's getting close, when people become lovers of money. Does anybody see that in our culture today? These are folks who make decisions based only on what makes them the most money. They will lie, they will cheat, they will swindle, they will steal, why? Because they have an unhealthy obsession with finances. Acquiring money and material possessions has become their God. They don't tithe, they don't give, they hoard. They cut corners. They don't understand that everything that you have was given to you by an almighty God and he placed those things in your hands that you might be a steward of those things. And in your business and in your busyness to make money, you don't have time for God because you're only trying to make the almighty dollar. Number three and four on this list is boastful and proud. Boastful in that they only talk about themselves. They make promises they cannot keep. They're proud, not in a healthy sense. These are people who see themselves as better than other people. These are people that don't need God because only weak people need God. And if you look at these first four signs of wickedness, people who are lovers of self, lovers of money, people who are boastful, people who are proud, this basically describes just about everybody living in the United States of America today. We don't need God. I know more than God. We have removed God from the throne of our life and we've put ourselves up on that throne. There are millions of people who literally believe, I don't need God, I don't need anything from God, I don't need to go to church, I certainly don't need anybody telling me what to do, church is for weak people, my money belongs to me, everything is I, 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 me, 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 mine, 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 God, shh, I don't need him, I'm good. Church ought to be the place where people come every week to come in here and get down on their knees and say, God, I am nothing without you and I need you desperately in my life. <laughs> Number five, six, and seven on the list are people who are abusive. Someone who speaks damage to others, someone who mocks others, someone who bullies others, someone who lashes out at others, someone who curses and insults others. People are abusive physically, people are abusive emotionally, people are abusive verbally. And all that abusive behavior comes from a heart that is full of hatred and bitterness. Disobedient to their parents. That's one of the biggest problems in our country today. We've raised up a generation of children who have no respect for authority. No respect for their moms and their dads. And if you're a young person here today, you're a child, you're a teenager, you need to know that God has a call upon your life to be obedient to your mom and dad and to honor your mom and dad. And parents, parents, you need to know you gotta be patient with them because sometimes they're slow to come around. I actually got a text yesterday from my son. He's in his 30s. 
I almost had a heart attack <laughs> because the text said, Dad, I love you and I want to say thank you. <laughs> That's never happened. But he said this to me. He said, I, I, wanna, I, I, I love you and I want to thank you for raising me to have good morals. <laughs> to have good morals. And parents, it's your job to teach your children to respect you. You should live a life uh, that your child can follow. And, you know, we take our kids off to school. I, 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 the school used to help. And now, I, I really believe the school, in some cases, they do more harm than good. Because they, they no longer teach kids how to read and write. I mean, have you looked at the, 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 the ranking of kids in America and in California? How good they can read, how well they can read? They can't, can't read or write. And they avoid science as to when life begins. And they ignore the fact that God was the one who created us male and female. And they will invite, they will invite atheists and agnostics to come into school and teach whatever they want to teach. But we've removed God and morals from the school. Now, I know that I'm older than dirt. I know that. But, and I've told you this before, I remember in my lifetime, I remember going to school and seeing the Ten Commandments on the walls of my school. It used to be that way. I, I remember as a kid standing in, in the hallway looking up and looking at the Ten Commandments on the walls of the school. Public school. Public school. And I looked at all the commandments. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. I, I, there, there was a moral, there was a moral a code that you had to live by. And number five, the fifth commandment there, I remember reading it, children, obey your father and your mother, for, for this is right. And so those principles are no longer being instilled in our young people. And what has the result been? Uh, again, a generation of kids not honoring their mom and their dad. Uh, being ungrateful, uh, we're, 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 we're supposed to be grateful but everywhere I look, there are ungrateful people. There's a sense of entitlement, being a prima donna uh, with a, a warped uh, sense of who you are. Because I, I believe every day that you wake up, the very first thought that goes through your mind ought to be a thought of gratitude. God, thank you for creating me and thank you for putting me here. Thank you for a healthy body and a healthy mind and a healthy heart. Thank you, God. I would be nothing without you, God. We should, we should be grateful, but I honestly don't see many grateful people. I see a lot of people who complain and fight and argue, and I, I, I don't see a lot of grateful people. Number eight on our list is unholy. When you see a lot of unholiness, people who are without love, people who are unforgiving, people who are slanderous, people who have no self-control, People who are brutal. Just leave, look at those six for, just look at those for a while. Everything in this Bible teaches us to do just the opposite of these six things. The Bible tells us that we're to be holy, not unholy. We're to be holy people. We'll talk about that in the, in the, in the coming weeks, but when was the last time you were with some guy and as you, you, you hung out together, and when you were done, you, you thought to yourself, man, that is a holy dude. That, that guy loves God more than life itself. When was the last time you were with some woman and you, got, you left that woman and you said, you know, that, that lady, out of all the women I've ever been around, that is a holy, that is a godly woman. That's a godly mom, godly mother. That's the way it should be because the Bible has called us to holiness. People who are without love and unforgiving, God's called us to love all people. God's called us to forgive 70 times seven. We're to seek reconciliation. We're, we are to restore gently those who have fallen into sin. We're not supposed to be slanderous. Slanderous is a word that we use to describe the devil. About 80% of what I see on social media are people just slandering one another. 
Self-control, I don't, I don't see many people who have control over the flesh. We kind of basically live our life where the flesh tells us and directs us in whatever we want, we do. And being not supposed to be brutal, I mean, have you seen the, the violence in the, in the movies that Hollywood produces and on television? Have you seen the violence in the video games that your children play? Where the graphics now are so realistic, it actually looks like you're actually killing someone. It seems like every day in our culture, we read some horrific story about someone killing someone else. We see these things happening right now, do you not? Number 14 on the list, it says that we're not to be, we're, there, when you see a culture that are not lovers of that which is good, you know that we're living in, in the end times. I read this week, I saw this, I, I couldn't believe it. There was a 50 year old man, everybody say 50. That's 5 not 15, 5 Everybody say 5 He's 50. And he's been swimming in swim meets with 13-year-old girls and changing in the girls' locker room and taking showers. And the reason he's allowed to do that is because he's identifying as a 13-year-old girl. And I actually saw the video. He's lining up on the starting block with all the little teenage girls and they're getting ready to dive into the pool. And there's a whole room full of adults. And not one person says, hey, this isn't right. And, and we're not, it's a, it's a generation of people where we're not loving that which is good. This, this, this man should be arrested is what he should be. But adults... Because of the political correctness of our culture, they go, oh, no, no, if, he's, if, you know, if that's what he thinks he is, then we gotta accept it. No, we don't have to accept that. <laughs> Number 15 on that list is treacherous, rash, 17, conceited, people who are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. You look at this whole list, you wanna know what this is? This, this is a, a, a group of people that have no reverence for God. It's basically no moral absolutes of any kind. There's no restraints of any kind. Every man and woman doing that which is right in their own eyes. And woe to the person who even suggests that God has a better way to live. And all of this is a result of people not following the truth of God's word because anyone who follows the truth of God's word would do just the opposite of everything on this list. I heard of a little girl one morning. She came into her mama. She said, Mama, what's the difference? What is, she said, what is the biggest sin between lying and stealing? Which is worse, Mama? Which is worse, to tell a lie or to steal something? And the mama said, well, honey, I think they're both bad. I, I don't think you should do either one. I don't know which, I don't think one's worse than the other. They're both bad. And the little girl said, well, mama, I, do th I think one's worse than the other. She said, well, wh wh which do you think? She said, mama, I, I think lying is worse than stealing. The mama said, well, why do you think lying's worse than stealing? She said, she said why do you think stealing is worse, worse than lying? She said, well, because if you steal something, you can always return it. <laughs> but once you tell a lie, a lie is forever. We know a couple of things about the devil. We don't know a lot about the devil, but we know two things about the devil. Number one, we know that the devil came to kill, steal, and to destroy. The second thing we know about the devil is that he's a liar and the father of all lies. And just about everything you see on this list, go back and look at that list, just about everything on that list were lies that were told by the devil that the people believe in his lies. And what we need to understand is that the devil does exist, and the reason he exists is to kill, steal, and to destroy. And Satan is trying to kill, steal, and destroy our lives. He's trying to destroy our families. He's trying to destroy our marriages. He's trying to destroy our schools. He's trying to destroy our church. He's trying to destroy our morals. He's trying to destroy our children. He's trying to destroy our nation. And so you see him leading these people down these paths where they believe these things. And Paul says, when you see the whole country and the whole world walking down this road, you need to know that Jesus Christ is about ready to return. And number 20 on that list might be the most damning of all of them. 
is in verse five when he says, when you see people who have a form of godliness, but they deny its power. You say, what's that? These are people who look the part, that sit through worship, that show up in church. They look like a believer. They might actually tell people, I go to shepherd. But inside, there's no real power. There's no real presence of God. There's been no real transformation. It's form without force. It's religion without a relationship. It's motion without meaning. Oh, on the outside, you might look the part, but on the inside, there's no fear of God. There's no real reverence for God. And so it always leads me to ask, how many people here today, how many people here today have a genuine relationship with Jesus? How many people here today were baptized They were baptized just so they could say, yeah, I got baptized. Versus how many people here today, when they came to to get baptized, they came to die to themselves and to bury the old man, the old woman, the old nature, so that as they come up out of that water, it was Jesus Christ in them. How many people here today, when we sang those songs of worship, you came here today and you literally laid your heart on the altar before God? How many people here today literally see everything they have, I mean everything they own, that that it came from God, their time, their talent, and their treasure? How many people here today see the church as the literal bride of Christ, that one day Jesus Christ is gonna come back and take his church? How many people here today believe that every word in this book is sacred and holy? How many people here today have a a genuine burden to see lost people get saved? And how many people here today walked in here to literally yield their life to a holy God who created us? And I just want you to know that when you see all these things happening, you better wake up because the end is near, amen? Now, I wanna go to the third because that second point, that was all a little negative. I wanna get to the positive stuff, amen? There are three decisions that you need to make in order for you to overcome these terrible times. I don't know how you can sit here and say we're not living in these terrible times because we're living in the terrible times, amen? But what are we as Christians, what are we to do? Three things, you gotta get all three. Number one, we're supposed to practice separation. You say, what is that? Well, look at verse five. At the end of this list of 20 things, having a form of godliness but denying its power, all 20 things, then he says this. Have nothing to do with them. Is that difficult to understand? Have nothing to do with them. Now, that sounds a little judgmental to me. That sounds a little narrow-minded, a little rude, a little unkind, a little unfair. Host of other things that are not politically correct. Paul says, have nothing to do with them. And what he's saying is that we should not be hanging out with people, just to hang out with people who do not understand that everything in life should be based on the authority of the Word of God and that this is how we are to live our lives. Now, we're not supposed to ignore people that are caught up in these 20 things. But Matthew 7, Jesus tells a story about two roads, and one road is this little narrow road, and only a few people are on it, but it leads to everlasting life. But there's another road, a broad road with a broad gate, and the Bible says that many people are traveling on this road, but this road leads to destruction. And what God wants for all of us is to not be on this broad road, just going with the flow. He wants all of us to be on the narrow road. You need to know if you make a decision to follow Christ, you're supposed to be on this narrow road. And there's not very many people walking this road because most people in culture are on this road. Now, I don't think we're supposed to ignore these people because everything I read in the Bible is that God came to restore and to rescue these people. And even though we're walking on the straight and narrow road, it doesn't mean we ignore these folks, 
We should be like the firefighters when there's a, when there's a flood and you see these water channels and someone gets stuck in that channel and they're floating and they're gonna drown and be thrown out to sea and die, the firefighters come along and they throw the rope out trying to rescue people who are on that road. And you and I, as we are walking on this road and you live here in LA, most of this city is on this road leading to destruction. They're the 20 characteristics that you read about there. We're not to ignore them, we're supposed to do whatever we can do to rescue these people, but here's the point. He says have nothing to do with them. What he's saying is there is don't just jump in with culture and just go along for the ride. Just hang out with these people. Now some of you are not gonna like what I'm getting ready to say. But if your buddies say, hey, let's go to Dodger game. I'm not sure you're supposed to go hang out with them. If they say, your friends say to you, hey, let's go to Vegas this weekend. Your friends ever say that to you? I know you're not supposed to do that because you're just hanging out with them. However, if your buddies ask you to go to a Dodger game and they're not saved, I think you should go if the only reason you're going is so you can show them how a Christian lives and build a relationship with them. So by the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh inning or on the way home, you can say, hey man, why don't you come to church with me this weekend? If you're building a relationship for the sole purpose of getting them over here on the straight and narrow path, then brother, you ought, to, you ought to be hanging out with them. But when you go to Vegas, you're just gonna hang out? Let's go hang out. No. You are to be, we as believers are to be separate from the world. We're not supposed to be like the world. I knew you wouldn't like that point. Number two, we should prepare for suffering. Because if you choose to get on this straight and narrow path, you will be made fun of, you will be teased, you will be mocked, you will be persecuted. Because all these people that are headed this direction, they will think you've lost your mind living for Jesus Christ. And Paul says, in the midst of these terrible times, you keep walking in faith and be prepared to suffer for the sake of Christ. Here's what he says, we're gonna read through this. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, and my what? My endurance. Verse 11, persecutions and sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, the, the persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. He's telling Timothy, Timothy, these same things are gonna happen to you if you live for Jesus. And as Jesus rescued me, he will rescue you. But stay on that path. And then he says in verse 13, it's a fact. Everybody say fact. It's a fact, Jack, he says that everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be what? Will be persecuted. So if you decide you're not gonna live these 20 characteristics, you wanna be different than the world, and you're gonna truly be a Christian, you better be prepared. It's gonna cost you. You're gonna lose some friends. You might even lose your job. You might lose your income, but he's saying stay on that path because Jesus Christ will rescue you the way he's rescued me. And number three, this is the most important thing here, write this down. We are to continue to pursue the truth of God's word. Do not believe what culture is pushing on you today, okay? Anything in your life, Keep your eyes in this book and let this book guide you. Let's read, and then I have a story to tell you that you need to hear. It says in verse 13, while evil men, everybody say evil men. While evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue 
and what you've learned and how you have been convinced of because you know from whom you've learned it and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus, verse 16. All scripture is God-breathed. You can't take scissors and cut out part of the Bible that you disagree with. All scripture is God-breathed, is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead in view of his appearing, in other words, he's getting ready to come back, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage. And my guess is if you're here today, you might have felt like you were being uh, corrected. You might have felt like you were being rebuked. And I hope you felt a little bit encouraged. With great patience and careful instruction, for the time will come. You see if we're living in this time. For the time will come will men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And the reason why I think there's so many people in this church today is because every week we stand up and we preach from the Word of God. And there will be someone here today who will walk out of here and will never come back because they didn't like something I said. And they're gonna go find another church where they're gonna say things that they want to hear. And all I did was basically read through this text word for word for word. This is what we need. Now, last story, last story. Back in the 1980s up in Washington, the great Northwest, geologists determined that there were signs that an earthquake, that an earthquake at a volcano was going to erupt on Mount St. Helens. So state troopers, forest rangers, media came out in force. Warning, 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 warning. Volcano's about to erupt. Evacuate, evacuate, evacuate. This went on for months. There was an 83-year-old man. His name was Harry Truman. No relation to the president. He lived five miles from Mount St. Helens. He ran a little lodge, lived in a little cabin. And they came by his house time and time again and said, evacuate, evacuate, evacuate. Oh, Harry said this. He said, nobody knows this mountain better than me. I'm staying. And little did he know, on May the 18th, 1980, he woke up, he went about his business, got a little lodge ready, fed his 16 cats, and fixed himself breakfast. And at 8 32 a.m., Mount St. Helens exploded with the force of a 23 megaton atomic bomb. The air instantly was heated to 600 degrees Fahrenheit. And the shock wave of energy traveling faster than the speed of sound, old Harry never heard it coming, followed by a 50-foot tall wall of mud and debris, flattened everything within 150 square miles. And they never found a trace of old Harry, never found a trace of his cats, never found a trace of his cabin. And I wonder what went through his mind the millisecond before he died when he realized that he had gambled and lost. 
And I think of that story, I think of all these things in the Bible, everything we talked about the last two weeks in Matthew 24, all these things we're looking at here today in 2 Timothy 3, the things we're gonna look at the next two weeks in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, and you see all the signs. It's God saying, warning, 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 warning. Get ready, get ready, get ready. All these signs I'm trying to get your attention to tell you that I'm about to return. And yet there are people here who are gambling and who say, you know what, I'm good. I'm just going to take my, I'm going to just stay where I am. Nobody knows what I'm doing better than me. No. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, you're not right with God, you're not living on the straight and narrow path, you're on this broad road leading to destruction, when I'm finished praying, you need to come down here and go through these doors where we have people that will pray with you and walk with you and talk with you through a decision where you bend that knee and confess with your tongue that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior so that when Jesus Christ returns, you're ready and waiting and working on his behalf. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. God, thank you for today. I just asked your blessing. I know we're a little bit late, but we were, we were early the last two weeks. But God, thank you for every person who's here. And as you are my witness, God, I'm not trying to scare anybody. But I'm trying to show people what the Bible says about the terrible times when we see things go from bad to worse. We see all the world events lining up, all signaling that the return of Christ is near. And there's not a single person here, not one person here has a guarantee that you're going to wait till tomorrow or next year or 10 years from now. There is, there is no promise of tomorrow. All we have is this very moment, this very day. And if there be anyone within the sound of my voice, God, that they're not right with God and they've not named you as their Lord and Savior, God, help them to come. Not, God, I, I pray that you would just keep them from leaving. That you would speak to them in such a way that instead of leaving, they would go through these doors over here and just say, hey, I want to I wanna get my life right with God. I want to be baptized. I think, I think so far this weekend, we've baptized 25 people already. And maybe there are others here today, God, who you will speak to through the Holy Spirit, through your word, through this message, that they will come and also surrender to you. I pray, God, if you do, Terry that you will help us to take every moment of every day just to invite others. I ask your blessing upon every man, every woman, every boy, every girl who's here today. And if you tarry, God, I ask that you would bring us back safely next week as we continue this series on the signs of the times we ask in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. God bless you and thank you for staying.